Well, right now, everyone's favorite personal financial advisor, the independent Magnus Hastick, is looking good once more. He's made a prediction. We didn't like him for doing it at the time, but my goodness, has it shaken up the world and those who are wanting to take money offshore and um, balance their portfolios with international investment growth, being disappointed by a sneaky move from the South African Treasury. A sneaky move, Magnus, but it uh, certainly hasn't uh, remained sneaky for very long because the article that you wrote that we published on Monday on Biz News has got 27,000 reads. So there are at least 27,000 people who now know that what Treasury would rather have not uh, wanted people to focus attention on. Indeed, uh, they're fully aware of it. Good afternoon, Alec. Yes, you know, it's one of those really strange things. You know, if sales controls has been part of our lives for many, many years in South Africa and has been, although it's been relaxed a lot, we still have foreign exchange controls. There's no question about it. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a legislation that's always fairly controversial, and especially the way it's applied by Treasury and SARS. It's, it's almost done in secrecy. Uh, they're very bad communicators. They don't communicate to the public. They rather communicate to their agents, their forex agents, the banks, the people who will deal with the public, and then also the tax lawyers, etc. And I was on a webinar on Forex and also financial immigration last Wednesday. And while the webinar was being hosted by uh, tax planning consultants, the kind of a flash came through that they've changed the rules again. So effectively, that webinar was taken over by people expressing surprise and outrage at these new set of rules which in my view is, is, is a severe tightening of exchange controls. Other uh, people have differed a little bit, saying it's not too bad and it was, it, was, it was coming anyway, but the majority of comments and people I've spoken to since then are very clear that, that almost in a sneaky way, SARS stroke Treasury stroke the government has tightened exchange controls and also the the the, the 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 collection of information about taxpayers, uh, both local and offshore, and about their assets and where it came from. So it is a new regime, in my view. It's going to be far more difficult for a certain category of people. And, you know, there are some, some the obvious questions. Are they tightening the net as part of a plan? to perhaps increase, you know, taxation and wealth taxes or even death duty. So it's a, it's, it's a new regime. So that's the first thing. The second thing we need to remember is in 2015, when the current foreign allowances, 1 million per individual plus the up to 10 million uh, per, per taxpayer was promulgated in 2015, the RAND was 12 to 1. So your one million rand could buy you eighty-five thousand dollars. Those numbers have not been increased. So your one million rand today only buys you fifty-three thousand dollars. And then, if you take into consideration the increase in the cost of living elsewhere in the world, price of assets, price of properties, effectively that million rand buys you about half of what it could buy eight years ago. And that, to my mind, is, is another form of tightening of exchange control. As South Africans, we can take out substantially less in real terms than we could eight years ago. And government has not adjusted those limits as one would expect them to do. So to say our forex laws have become very liberal is not correct. In fact, they've tightened up, and especially some of these new questions that are being asked are going to cause enormous headaches for people who have built up uh, foreign assets over a period of time. It's such an interesting subject, and there are so many angles that we can go through. But just starting on the one, 
Exchange controls are frowned at all over the world, but particularly by foreign investors, because if a government is not prepared to be measured by its own population on its policies uh, through something like exchange control, then the foreigners are saying, not so sure that I actually want to put money into that country. And what I mean by that is that if a government is not acting in the way that the wealthy people or the people who've got savings in a country uh, believe it should be acting, they will take that money elsewhere. And then, of course, the, uh, the currency will decline. But do you think then that there's a signal that is a lot bigger than all of this? It's almost, to me, it's almost like, well, let's tighten exchange controls in South Africa because actually we've given up the fight to bring in foreign investors, even though as a developing country, we've got to have them. Oh, I agree 100% with you. I mean, that's the big macroeconomic debate about forex controls or not. And if you if you look at the, the the successful countries of the world over the last 30 to 40 years, they have all, by and large, scrapped exchange controls, whether it's the United Kingdom, whether it's European countries or Singapore or Korea or a little country like Mauritius. They don't have foreign exchange controls which makes it so much easier to make a decision whether to invest in a country or disinvest from a country. So there's no, there's no debate uh, that we, the foreign exchange controls that we have is a major deterrent for people bringing money into the country because they might not get it out when they really want to get it out. So that is a very good point you know, that, that, you, that you make. And, and, and secondly, we kind of accept it as normal, but... When you do speak to the large fund managers or wealthy individuals, that is 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 an issue that that, that they're not comfortable with it, and uh, that pushes them to invest their money elsewhere. If you look at the, I was reading an article, um, Financial Mail, about the new listings on the Australian stock exchange the last twenty years or so. I think that's a couple of hundred new companies listed on the stock exchange. Uh, the Australian Stock Exchange, whereas in South Africa, our number has declined from about 700 to about 303. So we, and, and it, but with particular reference to mining companies, mining development companies, resource companies, they've just disappeared from the South African Stock Exchange, whereas they're booming elsewhere in the world, uh, Canada, Australia, Chile, and those countries. So we are paying the price, I have no question about it. Uh, you know, uh, Liberal economists have actually just stopped talking about it because it's, it's such a bolting factor in the decline of the currency. Uh, it, it goes without saying. Yeah, it, it is something uh, that brings home the impact of poor economic policies. But I guess, Magnus, if you're sitting in the ANC's shoes in Pretoria and you're applying first-level thinking, so you're not looking at what is what are international investors going to think about this? Are they going to be comfortable bringing money into the country? On first level thinking, you say, wealthy people in South Africa are taking their money out. Let's do a Sharpeville 1961 and stop them from taking their money out. Because we must never forget that it was only in 1961 and Sharpeville and the exporting of capital, rightly so, because people saw that as a beginning of, of a, a very bad and difficult period for South Africa, so the exchange controls were introduced at that point to block people from taking their capital out. It's that kind of approach. If I read your article correctly, they, the, the Reserve Bank has made it very difficult, if not impossible now, to take one of its regulations, which is you're allowed 10 million rand per taxpayer per annum out of the country, or indeed to financially emigrate. You have to go, go through so many hoops as you say in your article, that people just aren't going to bother with it. They might even look at doing things illegally. But is that not where we are finding ourselves right now? A bit of first-level thinking in Pretoria. Um, these guys, People are taking too much money out of the country. Let's just block them and not thinking of the unintended consequences. Again, you're correct. You, know, you must remember whenever you read the comment, and I'm being cynical here, by many well-known tax consultants who concentrate on on forex issues, you will never hear them saying forex controls should be scrapped because that's their whole industry gone. They they thrive and they grow based on the complexity of the rules, and they like rules because it means more business and more people are seeing tax consultants. 
So never ask the tax consultants whether forex transfers should be scrapped because that's like saying, oh, that's it, end of my business. Well, you don't need me anymore. So uh, that's just been my experience over the years about tax consultants and tax lawyers. They like the complexity. They like the opaqueness. But if you come back to the whole question of, of, of foreign exchange controls, you know, whether first level thinking, third level thinking, yes, you can. You know, the purists will tell you, if there is an incident that affects the currency, let it happen. Let the RAND crash because it will go to a level where it becomes very attractive for new people to enter the market and the market will stabilize. Now, I, I, I tend to agree that's the way we should do it, we, but we, we seem to think we can control these things, but by trying to exert control, you're actually interfering in the marketplace and the big players do not like it in today's age. And the more you interfere and try and control by means of cat and rules and regulations, the more you scare people away and say, we do not understand forex controls, we don't like it, we don't know what's coming our way, we would rather go somewhere else where our money is more appreciated. And I think we find ourselves in that situation. South Africa often forgets that it's a bit of a cork in the ocean. And I love uh, using a very obvious comment that South Africa's GDP is one-sixth of the value of Apple Inc. So Apple Computer can give away one-sixth of its, of its only one-sixth of its market cap, and that is the equivalent of all the money that is spent in South Africa in a year. It kind of puts it in perspective. And if you think you can, uh, with, with such a small little economy, that you can determine the way that market forces will move, you've got to be coming from a very weird socialist type of philosophical thinking. Yes, indeed. And I think that's the problem. Like, like the Nats before the ANC, the Nats also thought they could control it. They always overestimated their role in the world economy because, yes, they had um, controlled the gold market and, and now the platinum market and then perhaps a little bit of iron ore, but that's about it. We are a taker of prices. We don't make prices, and we have to accept that. But we cannot walk around, you know, trying to throw our weight around. We are not a big player, not a big player. We've seen it now. Uh, you know, we see it increasingly. We, 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 we alienating the United States, who is very friendly towards South Africa in terms of the AGOA Act and trying to support trade and investment. And we cozying up to the world's public enemy number one. And that's creating a lot of tension but below the surface on diplomatic levels. Japan showed signs of irritation by not inviting South Africa two weeks ago to the G7 uh, conference by basically saying you don't speak for Africa anymore because you've got a strange approach and a strange relationship with, um, with Russia. So we, we, we're playing a dangerous game in the cap, global capital markets where we're very dependent on the Europe, the UK, and, and, and the United States, Australia, and we, we, we're making friends with, with the bulkhead of the world, and I, I, I just don't understand it. We could pay the price for that. It, it does appear when you talk to people within Pretoria that there is an intention by the ANC government to play all sides, to be non-aligned, to try and have uh, friendships on both sides of the of the new um, bipolar world as it's going to be with China and, and America, uh, the, the big superpowers. So that is a very dangerous game, as you've just um, suggested, particularly if China hasn't got capital to invest in South Africa and the people who do are getting increasingly irritated. But the question I wanted to ask you about, Magnus, that you wrote in your piece was you said that people will find a way to take money out the country legally or illegally. Is this enough of an issue for, for uh, exchange control regulations to now be broken by uh, South African citizens, simply because they don't believe that it's a good law? Well, it's become very difficult. You know, SARS, the scenario has changed in terms of the um, sharing of information on a global scale, the grey listing issue. That is all playing into the hands of government where information is exchanged. So if you want to break the law, you must be very, very careful or, or do it from a country that does not have extradition treaties with South Africa. 
like Dubai and other countries like our good friends, the, the Guptas. It has become very difficult. Information is now shared widely. What I actually meant by that is that people will perhaps slow down the ex exportation of their capital simply by making use of the one million rand allowance. They will donate a million rand to each of their siblings or children. So they will slow down that process, that's, and that's totally legal. Secondly, as someone suggested to me this week, people will simply donate what they want to move offshore, although they have offshore into trust, pay the 20% and break that link between South Africa and, and the assets. So there's a price to pay, but a lot of people will pay it. They'll say, I'll pay 20% now. End of story, legal, declare it. The money's not mine anymore. But the, but the worrying sort of thing that I have picked up in our practice, and you know, because it's a countrywide practice, we see a lot of this over the last couple of years. We see a lot of the children of our clients moving out of South Africa before they start building up any assets. So, so even before they even register as a taxpayer in South Africa, the children are already gone. So they've broken that link from day one. They don't want to have links with South Africa. Now that to me is the most worrying feature of what we're picking up. And this is encouraged by their parents. The parents say, Yanni and Sonny, go, go with my blessing and I will send you money to set up your company, whether it is in UK or Holland or Australia or Mauritius, but do not have a link to South Africa. By that we're exporting our intellectual capital, we're exporting our uh, in, uh, intellectual youth and all those small startups that might or could have been started in South Africa are being started somewhere else. Now that is not evident overnight, but over years we'll realize that we have exported a whole generation of people. And one of the reasons, I'm not saying it's all of the reasons, is the tax regime or the fear of being taxed on your worldwide assets and income for the rest of your life, whether you immigrate or not immigrate. So that's the fear that we pick up, that people say, don't have any links to South Africa, start somewhere else. And those numbers are there. The young people are leaving. Yeah, that's a, that's a very clear trend. Uh, certainly with many of the people that you just anecdotally talk to, uh, they're here in Oman is where I now live. Uh, their children are all offshore, uh, with or with mostly with their blessing. But Magnus, just to close off with, Looking at alternative ways of getting money out the country, what about crypto? Crypto is supposedly untraceable. Is this something that I know we've had many uh, interesting discussions about cryptocurrencies and their value or, or otherwise. Is this something that might now become or receive more attention from South Africans wanting to internationalize their wealth? I think crypto might be considered one of the ways to externalize assets, but in this new SARS form that you have to fill in, they ask about crypto. So you have to indicate whether you have crypto assets or not. And somehow they might pick up in the future that you have got crypto assets, you didn't declare them, and that'll be the breach of, of, of legislation. So I, I, I think what really is going to happen, people will effectively, slowly but surely, their first investment that they make per year will be the 1 million rand that they can take out that's easy no questions asked, and off it goes. Probably from there, they will inject it into a trust on, on, as I mentioned earlier, on a donations basis, so you break that link. People are smart. People talk to a lot of smart people, and there will be ways and means to get around this, but it has become far more difficult. Um, otherwise, you simply say, look, I am in the tax net, and I'm going to pay the taxes, and I'm happy with that. But a lot of people are not happy with that for the simple reason that most people consider the government or the ANC to be uh, wasting all the money that they are collecting from hard, uh, you know, uh, you know, honest taxpayers. That's why they're so angry and they try and break the law. It's because the, the government is seen to be the biggest waster of public funds with no recourse to anybody in government or next to government, whereas Honest taxpayers are being nailed to the floor uh, every time they make a small, small little mistake. And that's the anger that could cause a lot of people to say, I'm out of here and I'm going to send my kids out of here. 
And, and, and that, as we say, we'll only see the impact 20 or 30 years down the line. Yeah, we're in a world where uh, very much the skills of individuals are the assets of a country, and South Africa just seems to be wanting to export it against all logic. Magnus Haystick is an independent financial advisor and chief strategist at Brenthurst Wealth. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.